Welcome to Rhyme City Podcast. This month's theme is One More Day. It's tribute to Recovery Month and World Suicide Prevention Day. That was the WSPD attached to that on the bottom of the screen, which is observed on September 10th. Uh, the word recovery, I kind of looked this up in Middle English, is to regain. I do like how when I look at the root of any word, I like to kind of find it interesting, intriguing, especially... Um, when I even go further, when it goes into um, little different definitions, is to obtain something that was previously lost. Today we have a returning guest, uh, Dr. Reshi Joseph. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insight again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Robert. Thank you. I just want a quick uh, disclaimer. Obviously, 988, the suicide lifeline in... Um, the states but i did actually do a little research because i always kind of felt bad that i didn't have any other suicide hotlines around the world those who are listening so in argentina is not one uh suicide hot- hotline is 135 armenia is 911 112 is a suicide hotline brazil is uh it's just an emergency line of 188 um and they go further i am near and dear to me i have a south korea because i'm half south korean so 112, um, and then United, United Kingdom is 999, um, or 0800-895652. I want to start off with a quote because uh, you know, Albert Einstein says it better than me. He says, Failure is, a su- is success in progress. When you think of that, you know, obviously we're talking about recovery month. We're talking about recovery in general. And also, obviously, um, sometimes the sad um, reality that people make that ultimate or decision to... Um, choose to end their lives what comes to mind when you hear this quote and and there's anything else you want to share rashi as we begin this conversation failure is set in progress if i look at that quote i think the word that i pull out of that is the word progress Mm -hmm. very often perhaps this is not purely about suicidality it's about Depression or mm. uh, despair mm. or any of those negative affect states. I think what tends to happen or what I observe happening is that people often find themselves thinking in very polarized ways, what I call black and white ways. Mm. So something is either success or it's a failure. Mm-hmm. It's either all good or it's all bad. It's either wonderful or it's dreadful. And there is a failure in the capacity to accept that nothing is... I'll borrow from Shakespeare, if I may. Mm-hmm. Nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm-hmm. And that the truth is, is that most of life... Well, so there, there are some, some exceptions. Mm-hmm. Um, child pornography that's that's just bad it's black Mm -hmm. helping an old lady cross the road that's that's white Mm -hmm. there are a few things that could be regarded as failure or success good or bad but the vast majority of life is not either good or bad it's progress of a kind it's a shade of grey And I think what this quote says to me is that there is a real danger that people fall into this trap of thinking something either has to work or it doesn't. Either has to work all times, in all ways, under all circumstances, in the way that I approve. If that doesn't happen, then it's an unwritten failure. I had a very interesting conversation with a client of mine the Mm. other day. And we've started the introduction of somatic work, so breathing, the meditation practice, so and so forth. So she goes off and she does this, and then she runs back to me and she says, "You know this thing that you've been uh, teaching me? Well, it doesn't work." Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, "Well, it doesn't work. Do you mean it doesn't work all the time in all circumstances?" in all mm-hmm. conditions you know or do you mean it doesn't work sometimes but it's helpful at other times 
And so it's the ability to recognize, look, it may not have worked this time, but that does not make it a failure. That's what that quote speaks. Mm, sorry, that's what that quote says to me. You know, um, thinking about what you just said, uh, you know, a lot of times I have, I'll be in front of a client and then, you know, they'll have that black and white or either or, and I say to my, I ask them, kind of funny question, are you allowed to get better? Uh, it's a weird question to ask, but it's, you know, we could be our own barriers at some point, you know, um, you know, there's a lot, there's given uncertainty and uh, not to quote like people who watch MCU with Endgame with Doctor Strange, he went through so many possibilities and we don't have the time or the ability to go through every angle of how one thing will go or not go our way. So I do find that, you know, when I see this quote, I kind of think of um, allowing ourselves to be human. You know, there is this process, you know, uh, I do feel a lot of things are learned but when it comes to like learn positive habits, learn certain conditions. Um, now, if you go, you know, Olympics just happened. There's people who are exceptionally good at certain things that, uh, you know, are a different apex of what I may be able to do. But at the same time, on the everyday thing, if I wanted to maybe learn a language, that's always kind of hard because, you know, you're there's... There's a lot of, it's not just learning how to read it, it's also speaking it and feeling comfortable to speak whatever new language you're trying to learn. But I do find that a lot of that is a lot of failures. You know, you can't just go out there, uh, pick up a skateboard and be like, I'm not going to fall once. You're going to fall probably several times. And I look at this as sometimes the barrier becoming ourselves. Um, we, there's a lot of uncertainty in the scary world right now, and it's hard for, uh, especially those who are struggling, to process it. You know, they, they we want things in ni nice little box, little box kind of makes sense. And I think some things are very comforting that way, but they can also be a um, a barrier at times. So that's what I get from here with fingers. Speak for yourself, Robert. Speak for yourself. Under this, uh, under this uh, disheveled, shallow, fifty-three-year-old man, I assure you, beats the heart of a gold medal Olympian. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you on that one. Completely with you on that one. Yeah. There's um. Well, I, I wanted to. Uh, uh, Go to this other an anonymous quote, but I do like this. Obviously, it has a trajectory. It's very inspiring. But I ask myself, why is it inspiring? <laughs> I am bent, but not broken. I'm scarred, but not disfigured. I'm sad, but not hopeless. I'm tired, but not powerless. I'm angry, but not bitter. I'm depressed, but not giving up. You know, there's this one thing that I, you know, the growth mindset, uh, you know, I, I always look at it and people, I think when I work with my clients and look at the growth mindset and the person may lost a job and they say, oh, well, I'm a, such a failure because I lost a job. And then right up next to it, it's like, I know this stinks right now, but I'm going to, I'm going to work on finding maybe something more appropriate, something that may be more fulfilling for me. The, the, I think the catch-22 is that people think that person who's trying to practice growth mindset still feels the same way as the person saying everything sucks. It's just they think that it'll, there'll be a delayed gratification or insight or growth because of their, I don't know, um, they know that they're going to feel bad. You know, a lot of things are uncomfortable. So if you lose a job, obviously, you can stay there and think about how you're feeling of losing that job or losing a relationship that's another thing you lose a relationship to like a loss this grieving process so i do feel that there's an assumption that oh, i'm just gonna be positive without the negative i feel like you are feeling these negative feelings but how you see whether it's impermanence or something that will eventually get them so so i don't know if that makes sense um it does when I read this quote, I think of it this way. Very often with the heavily depressed clients I work with, 
what I hear from them is what I broadly refer to as globalized negativity. Mm-hmm. Globalized in the sense that the negativity tinges everything. Mm-hmm. Every, you know, you'll hear statements like, everything sucks. Yeah. It's all going to hell. Mm-hmm. Nothing works. Mm-hmm. Everybody hates it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think to myself when they say everything sucks, and I think really everything. Mm-hmm. You mean, you know, Chinese food, you know, yeah. tantric sex. I mean, absolutely everything. Yeah. And um, the shift very often is one from globalized negativity to localized negativity, and that's from, I'm looking at the very last sentence in there. I am depressed, but I'm, but not giving up. Mm-hmm. So, if, for example, I'm working with someone who says, "Well, I'm, so, I'm so depressed, I can't get out of it. I'm, I'm finished." Mm-hmm. And if I were to able say to get them out of bed to um, order a pizza. Mm-hmm. Then what happens at a very small level is, I am depressed, but I was able to order a pizza. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a very small start to begin with, but if we build on that, and then suddenly, okay, you order a pizza, and you add to that, brushing your teeth, making a coffee, tidying up the flat, you know, on and on it goes. It's slow and patient work. Slowly, eventually, the person says to themselves, "Well, I'm very depressed. I'm terribly depressed, but I can order pieces, can make coffee, mm-hmm. can tidy the flat, mm-hmm. I can spend five minutes answering emails." And as that list begins to expand, mm-hmm. what happens is the globalized negativity becomes localized. It's mm-hmm. not that everything is negative. It's one negative thing in a sea of other things that might be positive, mm. and so it's the shift from globalized negativity into localized negativity. And eventually, there is a, a point of crucial mass where the person intuitively or intuits that mm. there's more by way of localized positivity than there is by way of Localized negativity, and that's when the globalized negativity suddenly shifts. The person realizes, "Wait, wait, just suspicions. Mm-hmm. I am the person." Well, yeah, okay, I might feel that way, but I mean, I'm out there at seven o'clock every morning going through. Oh, I make my own mayonnaise. I order pizza. I, mm-hmm. you know, do this. I go. You know, they have all of these things that go in there. It's mm-hmm. not the complete solution, but I tell you what: the person who does that makes an essential shift. They mm-hmm. shift from "I am depressed" to "Yeah, but I haven't given up. I've got yeah. plenty going on." It's yeah. very, very important shift. I. Yeah, and you know, it, it kind of reminded me of you know, I was in the U.S. Air Force in 2000, 2004. Those who, uh, and I just remember some of the hard moments, you know, I even take it for, for today with my work I do is um, sometimes it's just good to work a problem. Like you have a million things going on, but trying to do 10 or 12 things, let's work a problem. I remember I felt in the Air Force, I, I, joke, it, I joke a little bit that I was Chewbacca with not enough parts because I worked on planes. Never enough parts. But at the same time, I would say um, for those who are, um, you know, you know, there's a lot of struggles out there. A lot, of, you know, not minimizing people's context or their background. But I've seen wonders, and maybe related to what you're saying is just to work on some, like work one problem, like just work, like whatever. Sometimes it's something some may seem trivial, but I remember in the military, the one thing that was the most positive was. You know, it wasn't like I didn't even know what was going on politically at the time. I didn't know what's going on. Literally, I was just working with my my 
airmen at the time. I just worked with them. And for me, that was what was the best, I would say the best experience was that camaraderie, but we were just working a problem. It was an incredibly daunting problem, but I find that um, there's something about the belongingness that is huge. When you're able to belong to something or belong to an idea or belong to something you can start to build on bit by bit, um, yeah, you might be depressed. You may be experiencing a lot of different symptoms, but you, uh, a lot of times that I find that that builds some, I don't know, insight. And also, and, and also I, I've seen it and I've experienced, um, even though you're in the muck, you do feel that you never, you don't want to give up. And it's like, it's not very hard. It's hard to describe at the moment. You're like a million things could be going on, but at the same time, you're like at that last sentence, like you said, I am pressed. I am this or whatever you want to fill in there but not giving up the question might be for those who are globally negative why well because i am working this problem i'm working something I'm trying to and and the acceptance that we are human and i think that's where the failure in success and progress allowing yourself to be human because at the end of the day sometimes i had the hard conversation when it's uh, when the validation oversees the person's self-care when the validation of others supersedes anything that would intrinsically or um tangibly help them I'm, at the end of the day i asked them if you were homeless if you were homeless would these people these negative thoughts would these people be there would they sit there next to you would they help you in any which way and the question the answer is usually no so a lot of times we so eventually, and I sometimes get to the point, um, especially when there's really deep negative thoughts, I said, it hasn't worked. <laughs> you know, it hasn't worked. We get to that point. Try to start somewhere. And then that's, I think that's what um, what I see when I see uh, what you've said in reading this quote. Um, any thoughts? Anything else you want to add? Yes. Yeah. Um, no, not really. I think no, not really. Okay. Not really. Yeah. But it's fine. Um, as a U.S. Surgeon General, I I was I picked it up in uh, while I was going through the internet. Eighty-two page article about our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. I thought it was interesting. I didn't really able, was able to comb through it all, but there were certain parts that I wanted to share with those uh, for, with us today. Uh, says. He says in the beginning of, I think in the preface, he says, loneliness and isolation represents profound threat to our health and well-being. And as he continues, he says, and we can ensure our country and the world are better poised than ever to take on the challenge that lay ahead of us. And he says, our future depends on what we do today. So there's a sense of urgency on the idea of loneliness that obviously doesn't get on the doesn't get on the full stage because a lot of times, you know, loneliness is perceived a choice, but sometimes it can be a state of mind that it's hard for an individual to get out of. It doesn't matter if people are around them, disconnect is real. I do feel it was interesting to kind of see, and this was written in 2023, so it was last, last year. So any thoughts on this as we um, continue? The person I think uh, who wrote most eloquently on this, and very triestantly in my view, was uh, the great French sociologist Emile Durkheim mm -hmm. in his book on suicide that I quoted in many podcasts. He's very clear in this book. Mm -hmm. He's very clear. He states it explicitly. He says that where fantastically tribal as a species that our sense of well-being is interdependent of course we now have the, the research of Dan Siegel and we have Louis Cozzolino who done all the research on personal neurobiology there is a biology between us as well as we. Um, but the person who really kicked it off was Durkheim Durkheim was a in saying that 
societies and communities of, are the, the lifeblood, the heartbeat of the individual's well-being. If you fragment that and if you destroy that, then what you are doing is you are initiating a process where people begin to destroy themselves. He gave a number of reasons for this, not all of which I agree, but I think the primary thrust of his argument, which is our societies, our community, that's the buy-in that we have. Mm. Part of part of our sense of identity comes from the community we align. Of course, this can have problems, we can be very tribal, you know, things can integrate into conflict, but that that tribe is as much as part of how we derive a sense of who we are mm -hmm. as something else. If you deprive someone of that, to a very large degree, there is no ability of a person to know who they are. And if there is no buy into it, then what they do is they destroy it. Because why would you preserve something that had no value for you? So mm -hmm. that would be the first. The second is the, I would point to the research of Professor Aaron Shaw, UCLA, mm. who asks a very important question, you know, who are we? How do we yeah. define who we are? Mm. And in his wonderful book, Affect Regulation and the Origin of Self, mm. he advances the, the idea that who we, who we really are, who am I when I'm speaking to Robert? Well, who I am is very largely what I have to do to self-regulate and to affectively regulate when I'm talking to you. Mm. Now, when I'm talking to my mother, that system is different. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking to my boss, that's different. When mm -hmm. I'm talking to my colleagues, junior or senior, it's different. It's in that moment, what systems do I require? What metabolic expenditure is there, what allostatic load is there on me in self-regulating in the presence of another person. To some degree, that decides who I am, because who I am with mum is very different to who I am with Robert, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, imagine a situation where you don't have anyone. Mm -hmm. You don't have anyone. You don't have a mum, you don't have a Robert, you don't have a CEO, you don't have a boss, you don't have any of these things then how does that mechanism work? Mm -hmm. The answer is, it can't. Mm -hmm. And so, in Alan Shaw's paradigm, if you do not have another right brain against which to self-regulate, then it's not possible for the emergence of a sense of self. And mm -hmm. that's the crisis of loneliness, I think. If you're isolated and you're lonely, then at an actual neurological level, the self itself is under threat because you need another brain against which to regulate for yourself to emerge. So that when I'm with mum, oh, I know who I am. So I have to regulate in this way. I have to behave in this way. I have mm -hmm. to be, you know, and, oh, I'm with Robert. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and all of this stuff is happening at a near unconscious level, but it is there. Shaw's research demonstrates this conclusively. Cosolino, to a degree, backs him up, mm. as does Siegel. And it gives us now the neurological basis as to why we are so tribal as a species. And if I was asked why the loneliness epidemic is such a problem, it is because without people, our sense of self cannot emerge. Mm. You know, um, in um, my line of work, a lot of times I deal with people who are coming out, sometimes of state hospital. One thing that I found interesting about that was um, a lot of things you over I overlooked. And I, I learned this epiphany with a person who was very compliant, very good, acclimating well, getting all connected to services. But then when I asked the individual, When's the last time you made a decision? He says, I don't. 
and, and I thought about what you're talking about. He said he doesn't. I'm like, what do you mean you don't? He's like, well, I was, you know, X, Y, Z, like, and this is several ones. And I realized this. He's like, I was in the hospital for 15 years of my life. I'm like, okay, 15 years in the state hospital. And they told me what to do. I'm like, okay. So, like, for instance, he, he wants to get cable for his internet. And I said, well, did you talk to your mom and working with him? And he's like, yeah, she said, you know, I have to be careful with spending money. And so I, and so then I thought that means not yet. So basically the individual thought because the person didn't say anything positive, the person doesn't um, decide anything. So I, for me, I didn't know that, that, that I, I was this person's um, and persons because there's several people that I work with in that context. Um, the idea of, I guess, deciding decisions you now what do you do each day uh, i think that can impact at least i feel it has impact this individual of what self is for him because everything was actually kind of told him what to do so it's it, i i do bring this up because it is hopeful because now it's on the surface and it's something i'm trying to address with several of my clients but i didn't know that that you know the just a fact the sheer fact that we take advantage of every day of deciding here and there others may not feel that they have that so it's just something that i thought was intriguing i wanted to share well if we consider that one group of clients you know i i i went slightly at using these terms but the one clients mm -hmm. refer to borderline personality disorder and mm -hmm. people know who these you know these individuals are Mm -hmm. One of one of the the recognised symptoms of this is an an inability to um, find a sense of who they are. They very often will say things like, "You know, I don't know who I am." Mm -hmm. I mean, I posit that the reason why many of these people say have a real difficulty, a real crisis of self identity, is because they are unable to form meaningful relationships. I mean, you can give reasons for why that is, you know, the the anger, all the rest of it, you know, the switching, the idealization, devaluing, you can do all of that stuff. But ultimately, the reason why so many of these women and men say, I just don't know who I am, who am I? The mm. reason for that, or part of the reason for that is because they can't form secure attachments. To other people, I see. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to like switch gears uh, just a little bit. Um, I know that there was a book that you wrote before that you wanted to uh, uh, share, and we, we talked about this before. But I thought it was a great addition, especially um, this month's theme. And just you know, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share that. So the floor is yours. <laughs> But go ahead, and you can go ahead and share. I, I think it's a good, good segue to as we, as we continue on. All right. Well, I'll I'll give a sort of slight throat clearing. Uh, Robert and I, when we first came on, were talking about suicidality, and I share the introduction to my book on trauma. It was a bright, hot, humid morning in 2017 when my watch ticked 7:30 prompting me to get ready for the first client of the day. In my case, this meant inhaling another double shot latte and shifting the mental gears into work mode. Suddenly, unexpectedly, my mobile phone rang. I looked at the screen, it was a number I didn't recognize from a country I'd recognize. Dilemma. I had only 30 precious minutes of rare quiet before the client could begin to pour in. And I was in that peace until this interruption, which I ungenerously thought of as the height of bad manners. Should I take this call? I didn't call. On the other end of the line, faint voice of a woman I didn't know. The voice was shaky and soft. She introduced herself. I asked both questions, where she was from, how she got the number. Eventually, we reached the point where I was able to ask the key question. So, Ms. X, what can I do for you? following was her answer. Dr. Joseph, I'm a physically healthy woman. My husband has a good job. We have more than enough money. I travel the world. I have three beautiful children whom I adore. 
a husband that gives me everything I need or want, and a beautiful house in North America overlooking the most gorgeous lake. Right now, I am standing at the end of a pier that runs into the deepest part of the lake. I have concrete blocks tied to my ankles and bricks in each of my coat pockets. You ask what you can do for me. I'll tell you. I need you to give me a reason not to step off this pier. So, I um, so obviously my question is what happened. <laughs> but wow, that would be uh, um, available yeah. at fine Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it you know those those. And, like, when I think about this title, One More Day, you know, it could be one more hour. It could be one more, like, 15 minutes. It, it doesn't have to, like, a One More Day is, a, when I thought about the this month and suicide, uh, World Suicide Prevention Day, I thought a lot of times most critical moments in a person's life is not long. It's, like, short and, and, and spans. So, I like, hearing that, obviously, it's, it, it, it's in. It's all obviously shares, kind of. It's not how people look like. What demo? What demographic? What account economic? It doesn't matter. They have a happy marriage. It doesn't matter any of that. It doesn't matter. They have happy kids. It's it, it's. And that's where I feel that this you know when we as un under i guess underspoken about as much suicide a lot of times i feel gets it gets a lot of attention and then it doesn't you know it gets a lot of attention when something happens and then all of a sudden um you get kind of these common words like i i, I don't know why they would do that and then they'll say something like oh that is so selfish they're trying to re like, process it themselves of what what they would respond but at the same time uh, when I think about this month, as we did um, remembering other names in May for Mental Health Awareness Month, I, I, I just, I just kind of see that at least what we read the fragileness that human beings can get quickly. So, um, yeah, wow, thank you for sharing that. And all, obviously, I, I do, I do value my guest so if you want to know more about them, there'll be a link on the bottom of the note so i do encourage you to check it out um, i'm going to check it out i'm curious of what what is uh on else in that uh, in your book but <clears throat> well, you like want to add yeah i'd like to add well first of all i'd like to say that that book i'm going to it's going to be made available to so i'm working for a company and we're looking at ways to make the book available for free on a website for people who sign up for our newsletter so that's mm. coming very soon so you won't even have to pay for it that's the first the second was i didn't mean to be facetious by ending the story yeah. i ended it there because i wanted to communicate the gravitas of the feeling of it yeah well yeah. And I wanted to do that because I know there will be people listening to that who knows exactly what that feels like. Mm -hmm. Circumstances are different. They're in a different country, you know, different place. I often say, you know, being, being a billionaire is not a vaccination against suffering, mm -hmm. right? So it's really irrelevant and the reason i ended the story there was i wanted to transmit and to communicate that feeling of despair and utter hopelessness and that i know that there are people in there that would connect that to say any more than i thought would have been counterproductive. Mm -hmm. 
was uh, yeah. Uh, and again, I want to. I always like to encourage those who are listening. If you know someone, if you yourself are struggling, I do encourage you to find help now, like literally right now. Um, as much as it's like like uh, Rashi said, you know, as much as we may want to know, the whole point of us is to show. I guess for me, like I said, the end, the fragility of our human and human self, and how important this, how 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 we look at, how we experience, uh, what we our recovery, how we know. I guess the hard the thing is for me is getting to the point where I can ask for help. Like getting to that point as an adult, you know, you may not have all the answers, and a lot of times you don't. You don't have, to, you can't make it all perfect. And that in itself, I feel it's okay. It's when we put these barriers, like I said, kind of jesting. Uh, are, are, am I allowed to get better? Am I allowed to feel better? Am I allowed to do better? These are kind of questions that a lot of times, of course, I, a lot of times I get a little upset. I'm here, of course. But like, if you really think about it, it dives a little bit deeper what, what it means to allow yourself to means that sometimes you say no to people sometimes you put boundaries to things that are not helpful for you sometimes you reevaluate because if you want things to change nothing will change if nothing changes so that means that sometimes you have to be open-minded to something that may be a little bit discomforting um, but i just remember for me like hearing that story just reminds me of despair when i tried it and i remember that and that feeling and for me, it was uh, something that I was just kind of still kind of um, uh, the idea I was lucky. And I'll say this, uh, and obviously I, I over overused uh, sleeping pills. I had a plan. I And then I was in the room and I didn't think it was working. And then I went out and I went to the wrong room. Like it, it was in the like, and they called the hospital. If I stayed in my room, I won't be here. I won't be talking to you guys. And for me, it's, it's haunting. Obviously, I went through therapy. I went through um, different forms of trauma therapy on it. It doesn't impact me as negatively. It's just something that I have experienced. It does still kind of eerie at first for probably several decades. It's been a while since that happened. But still, I remember just... Uh, I, I'm trying to write my own book. It's called right now. The working title is "The Wrong Door" because it was the wrong door. So um, um, it's going to take a little while for me, but at the same time, I do feel that um, when I heard that, I you know, there's a, definitely a commonality of what I despair, like you described, that I I felt myself literally. I didn't ask for help, so like I'm encouraging people not to be me. You know, I was lucky. I went to went out, went for a walk because I was stubborn because I didn't think it was working, and I went to the wrong place. And that person, lucky enough, saved my life by calling the whole uh, hospital to get my stomach pumped and everything. So, um, don't be me. Be better than me. Be better than me and ask ask for help in that regard. So, I want to um, um, move forward and thank you again for sharing that. She. Um, Loneliness is the least favorite thing about life. Uh, that thing that I most worry about is just being alone without anybody to care for or someone will care for me. And this just kind of strikes me of the relationship. You're not able to build relationships or build connect with others. It kind of speaks volumes when, when you're talking about loneliness. Significant, not just people around you, but people that you can really connect with. Um, I want to just keep going forward i don't see how you can respect yourself if you must look in the hearts and minds of others for your happiness this is, th this is kind of wisdom of mind that you could get later on but it's a process you don't get there by just reading this you get there by feeling it and then understanding it through the feelings and your experience anything you want to add or say about the two quotes i just kind of went well my favorite hunter is Thompson quote is um, buy the ticket, take the ride. <laughs> I'm a yeah. firm believer in that. Uh, what I would say in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the loneliness quote from the previous person is yeah. 
I draw a distinction between loneliness and solitude, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that there there is a, di a difference. Sometimes it's very difficult to decide precisely where that line is. Mm -hmm. Loneliness is certainly a real problem right? when one yearns for human connection and it's not there. When one needs to be supported in extremis and the support is not coming. Mm. When all of the uh, the Durkheimian aspects are there, and you know, all the others who study this, and the most recent one I think is the book by Johann Hari on depression and how he links it to a loneliness epidemic. I think he oversimplifies it. He, he he makes some significant errors in, in his in his book, but I think the general thrust of it is quite an accurate one. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly that. Mm -hmm. But I'm reminded of something I did some years ago with, uh, with someone who was a client of mine a very long time ago. He did an exhibition. He's a photographer. He's a CEO of a massive company, but he's also a very good photographer. And the title of his exhibition was From Loneliness to Solitude, From Isolation to Solitude. It's come mm -hmm. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to draw a distinction between these two things. He wanted mm. a distinction between someone who felt completely isolated and lonely and mm. that. And this other thing that we have, which is solitude, which is again something different, where the line is between those two things. And where that line is, I think, is different from it. All of us, mm. and I think that the metric that moves moves us from one to the other mm. is our own personal growth. Mm -hmm. As I grow as an individual, as I see others grow as individuals, loneliness tends to ever away. Mm. Connections become better. The mm -hmm. attachments become more secure. Mm -hmm. The friendships become more curated. Mm -hmm. The circles become tighter. Yeah. And the other metric of growth is that the person becomes more and more comfortable in their own company. What is meditation after all if it's not solitude? Yeah. Yeah. What is yoga if it's not after all solitude? Um, and, and so there is a journey. There is a yeah. growth. And I think yeah. the growth is from isolation and loneliness, alienation, dislocation. Mm -hmm. And it's through the growth process, the recovery process, moving from that to um, one of um, sort of enjoyable solitude, if you like. I, I like that you mentioned uh, the, you know, the difference between solitude and loneliness and i do believe that um sometimes there's a big shift of connection so let's say someone gets sick someone used to be around a lot of people and they had to maybe lose they lost their job or lost their relationship that feeling may not be hard for them to dis distinguish it from either or because they have just they used to be going out connecting with others now they're home alone with this illness that they don't understand, with these circumstances that they're not, they're not comfortable with. And that in itself doesn't, and I'm not just saying that may make um, it unclear because the person's still trying to find out what that looks like. And then belonging comes in time. So I do feel sometimes even I look at um, my own journey, I just, I feel that there is always this ebb and flow of kind of understanding what it is to be. You know what is what is the definition? Where is my solitude? I am vastly more comfortable with myself, like in the sense of just being around. I love having my um, this podcast, of course, and also my other hobbies. I do enjoy the tinkering of life. I do like working on one thing, and not, I also be careful of not, you know, I can't make up sleep, so I have to find my way to stop myself but i do enjoy that i'm not gonna be perfect at anything per se but i'm gonna be growing 
and I feel one person said this way very kind of it seems kind of bleak but um uh, what is it most of our life will always remain unfinished until we pass away so it's kind of weird to say it that way but I do feel feel it gives me a little bit of comfort that it's okay that things are not always completely finished like in the box that we like and allow that process um I want to, as we wrap things up, I want to get your, um, I have a cute, uh, just one more question I want us to kind of work, um, talk about one more day. Obviously, that's the theme I've been kind of pushing and also um, for this month. What do you think is important? For, when we think about Recovery Month, what do you want to share with those who are listening? What do you think? And then, oh, I didn't put it here, but also World Suicide, WS. Um, PD, World Suicide Prevention Day, what would you like people to remember? And when you think of the word, the, the theme, one more day, what does that mean to you? I guess that's choice. Well, first of all, I'd like to echo what I thought you said very brilliantly, which is in, in, the, in the nine decade long dash from the cradle to the grave. If we think of it that way, mm-hmm. the only thing that we have is to enjoy the journey. Mm-hmm. And if I can perhaps paraphrase and summarize what you said, it's looking for points that give us reasons to tarry, give us mm-hmm. reasons to stick around. Mm-hmm. And that mad dash that we all are in. You know, grave to grave, nine decades, go for it. That maybe a good thing to do would be to stop and to say, are there reasons to tarry? You mm-hmm. know, maybe a relationship, maybe mm-hmm. a friendship, maybe an activity, maybe art, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, which I understood, which is what I understood you saying. I think that's a brilliant way to approach subject and in terms of one more day being the theme um, recovery um, I don't know that I have anything profound to to add to this mm. except to say that it's mm. just another day and like every other day what I try to do is to extract as much as I can Mm-hmm. from from the day as I possibly possibly can there there is stuff that I'm going to do and do oh well. mm-hmm. I, sh- I should celebrate that if I can mm. find to celebrate that so much mm-hmm. better mm. try and do that and then there are things that I will do as well that I'll think about and perhaps win or find mm-hmm. aggressive <laughs> mm-hmm. that you look in the mirror and you think gosh did I see that mm-hmm. um, but, but, you know, that's never far away but as you very wisely said Robert that, that's very much part of part and parcel of this journey and is to be enjoyed as much as uh, the other stuff. sorry yeah. that's just my no my worries I'm so, I'm so sorry I'm so sorry yeah, and um, you know just to, to wrap things up with what you just said is you know a lot of times I feel that um, part of like the in between that we can uh, at least I find very helpful is just to be kind to yourself. Like honestly, a lot of times we forget our context. It's very easy with this grouping that the society does to everyone. So you're this group, and this is what you should be doing. And I ask yourself, what do you want? What is success defined for you? And I feel the one thing that no other species does is reflect we're the only species that reflects in this world about what we do so if a dog does something bad it may feel bad at that moment but they don't reflect oh how am i a bad dog or a good dog it's it's at least we can't say that we can even see that but in our own self we have this opportunity whenever we do come through maybe trials or or situations we can reflect not only to that recent incident but also even back further we can we can remember things we've learned 
along the way and we can actually get to the point like we said earlier in that one quote i am depressed but not giving up because there's some insight there's some idea some memory that you remember that this sucks right now but it won't suck always and like going through that working those can be i guess profoundly healing also also gives a lot of strength i just you know a lot of times i don't like to coddle when it comes to a lot of my clients in the sense that i find if i answer like do things and a lot of times you see this a lot of families you rob them of the opportunity to fail and learn from it i'm not saying within within respect of context you know obviously nothing reckless at that regard but you don't at the end of the day if the person comes up with what their version of success is on their own it's kind of going to stick more than if either one of us or anyone say you know this is this is success this is what you need to do and that's why i feel you're 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 outsourcing your success to other people's ideals and i feel that that is um i guess robbing yourself from the opportunity to find who you are and actually find a direction that may be more solidified moving forward as we speak about recovery day as we wrap up today again i want to say thank you rashi any final thoughts that you have as we wrap up uh no real final thoughts what i would if i may be allowed to do a sort of a short plug if yeah. that's okay so i'm currently working for an organization in australia called highlands recovery mm -hmm. we're doing all of the stuff that we you and i talk about on a regular basis um you can find us at highlandsrecovery.com.au a lot of this material is on now and what i would say though i mean Robert, you and I have known each other. So it's always a pleasure to be on a podcast with you. And thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you for coming back. I I always find that it's, it's, it's encouraging to have other people passionate about things that, matter, that are not on the surface. Things are deeper. Things like that, you know, a lot of times get sh shooed under the rug. A lot of times people get confused with the title Revive Ministries because they think it's a, a, a proselytizing ministry. But for me, I kind of take the model of a medical ministry where they go out and they, you know, there's nothing about proselytizing. It's really about people. You know, a lot of times, and how, a lot of times when I think about caring for people or even myself, remember my story, is you, you treat the person first and then you treat what they're going through. And in the regards, I'm giving, uh, I love the fact that I have this platform where we can continue the conversation at the very least. And I thank you and all the guests. You, you, uh, all, um, just continue the dialogue. And I do appreciate, uh, all the insight you've given throughout the many podcasts you've been on here. So thank you again. Well, Robert, as I've said already, it's always a pleasure to be a podcast with an old friend. Thank you for having me. No problem. I just want to say, stay updated with Revive Ministries through the various platforms, RevimeMinistryFL.com. Leaving with this last quote from Roy Mackville. He says, when a defining moment comes along, you can do one of two things. Define the moment or let the moment define. 